Yeah, thank you everyone for being here. Um, indeed, my talk is called Unsupervised Shallow Learning for Fraud Detection on Marketplaces, and I promise that by the end of the talk, all these words in the title will make sense. Um, to actually introduce a bit the matter, I need to explain a bit, just very briefly, what we do in Agen. Uh, most likely you haven't heard of this company, but pretty sure that uh, we know you. Agen is, in a sense, a, a payments processing a fintech. Um, it's, uh, it's working worldwide. We have our HQ in uh, Amsterdam, but with offices uh, all over the, the world. Um, if you have ever used Uber or Netflix or Spotify or you buy a Mango or McDonald's or Subway, any of those brands, we are the people behind doing the, the handling the payments. Um, and just, just to see the scale we're processing, la last year we processed half a trillion through our, through our servers. And I'm here to talk about um, marketplaces, right? So we also have an offering for, for marketplaces. If you recall, maybe three years ago, um, eBay and PayPal divorced, and that's where we basically uh, got eBay. And this is one of our marketplaces, along others, like Wix or Vinted uh, or GoFundMe. And, well, fraud can happen in those marketplaces. Let me, let me just give you a, a two seconds around fraud. We have one flavor of fraud called transaction risk, and what happens here is that you trust the seller, the merchant, right? Think about, I oh know, Spotify, right? So you don't doubt Spotify. What can happen, though, is that there is a shopper that has used, uh, say, a stolen card, and then tries to clear the, that card to see if it works, to test it, or just actually steal money, right? And in this setting, well, you trust the shopper, you, sorry, you trust the seller, you don't trust the shopper. That is the transaction risk setting, right? By the way, we do that on real time uh, in our, in our uh, transactions. When we have a marketplace, though, uh, that's more complex because you don't trust the seller in the same way that you would trust an enterprise, right? Anyone can set shop on eBay, set up a profile, we KYC you, we collect information such as your passport and bank account and so on, but we don't really know you, right? We don't have a relationship through account managers and all that. So it can happen that you have both a shopper and a seller doing shady stuff on a marketplace. And this is obviously not good. And that was we're trying to mitigate with uh, our algorithms. To do that, we offer our uh, merchants uh, a tool called Score. And, and Score is a, is, a, is a product that marketplaces can use to detect fraud. And it works in two layers. Let me, let me explain briefly the architecture we have in Agen. Our main platform is coded in, in Java and Postgres mostly and exposes endpoints to the outside world to do payment processing and banking and KYCs and stuff like that. Uh, and next to it, we have a big data platform uh, that we don't expose publicly. It just serves for the decisioning to the, to the main platform, right? On the, on the main platform, the one done in Java and, and, and Postgres, uh, Score, what it does is collects information such as, again, for example, KYC attributes, and then we, cleared, uh, we, we, we create identities, we call them, like communities. For example, if you share, if you create two profiles, but with the same bank account, we pretty much know you're the same person behind, right? Um, on the big data platform, we, do, we run algorithms, machine learning algorithms to, to detect uh, behaviors, patterns that could tell us that something is going on. Think scam, for example, right? And then we tell that to the main platform, which computes a risk score, and that's what we serve to our merchants, right? So, so then we say, well, this seller has a high risk score, meaning that there's something going on in there. I will show examples later on. This talk today is focused on this bit. So how we leveraged uh, technologies such as uh, Hadoop, Spark, Airflow, TensorFlow, Python, to detect all these uh, behaviors. Now, in order to just set the scene here, I want you to think for a second uh, on, a, on, a, on a little quiz here. I'm going to show you a data set, a very, to a very uh, a play toy data set. And I want you to think for, for a minute, what do you think is unusual, anomalous about this data set? Here it is. Now, most of you could say, um, Five and six are weird because they are lonely and miserable there. And you're right, they are what we call global anomalies, right? They just don't fit in this data set. But if we look at, for example, um, number two and number one, right? Why is happened, what's happening there is that you have quite some density of square, orange, orange squares, and then you have a purple pentagon on it. That's odd. And on number two, you have the same with triangles and crosses, right? 
These are the anomalies we try to find with those algorithms. We try to find unusual behavior given the peers, right? That's what we call a global anomaly is rather different from a, from a, sorry, a local anomaly is rather different from a global anomaly. And then the other clusters, zero and four, pretty normal, everyone behaves. And number three, well, is red and a lot of shapes, so you cannot really say anything about what is expected shape around that, that, that cluster, right? Let's, I'm going to run uh, our process that we did to actually understand the algorithms and the technologies to, to, to solve this problem in a very iterative way, by the way. Uh, and I'm going to use an example for that, uh, a real example, actually, from, from the business. Uh, a significant shopper. And a significant shopper is basically a shopper that has done an unusual high amount, high ratio of the revenue of a seller, right? So if you look at the meme, is normal for a shopper to spend 10,000 euros? Well, it depends, right? If you are selling diamonds, then probably it's all right. But if you are in Febo, then, then that's definitely unusual, right? And if you don't know what Febo is, unless you are Dutch, you wouldn't know. But I live in the Netherlands, I'm Spanish, I like my food. But in there, they actually like their food this way. It's basically cold fried stuff in vending machines. Um, yeah. Well, they love it. They find the liquor there. I, I don't. But uh, anyway, bottom line, don't spend 10,000 euros a month on that. It's not good for your health. So we try to solve that. Uh, and the first thing we observe is that um, the ATV, which is the average transaction value, so what is the normal transaction value of a, of a certain seller? Say, if you're an Uber, that could be around $15, say. Uh, but if you are, I don't know, uh, an electronics store, it's $500, right? Uh, but you say, okay, well, depending on the other ATV and depending on the volume, right, big store, small store, then there's a correlation there I can exploit to actually make up my mind on the expected behavior of the shoppers, right? So let's do it, right? And that's what we did. We, we just went machete in our teeth and we tried to solve the problems, right? And the first thing you do is, uh, well, you, you try to use AI as most companies claim they use AI. You use the if statements, right? So you build a rule. And you say, well, if the ATV is here and there, and the volume is between these and that, then yeah, th that's it. That's it. We made AI. We're great, right? But just don't. We didn't. We didn't, right? And you can already see here that that you have a problem with the notes. By the way, uh, it's going to come in handy later. Um, this means that we're going to divide this data set in square areas, right? So we're going to put these lines somewhere, and we're going to say, okay, here is this, and here is that, and and then we're going to make our our mind about about the expected behavior. Now. Rules are not great, and why? Well, if you want to have certain minimum performance, you're going to have to have a lot of nodes. And this is something that you have to configure manually, either in your JSON, YAML, or whatever configuration files you use. Hard-coded, no, but still. Uh, and still, it's going, to have, it's going to have bad performance, because it's just a rule, right? It's not very complex. The data set is very rich, it's very wide, it has a lot of variety, so it's absolutely impossible to actually treat that with rules. But it has a good thing, and the good thing is explainability, right? Because um, we humans are, are, haven't yet learned to trust the machines. We, we really like to stay in control, and we need to understand what the machine decides for us to feel, I don't know, more intelligent, I guess. Anyway, that's something that happens. Explainability has a lot of uh, um, buzz right now as well on machine learning, uh, and regulators certainly love rules. So. There it is, but it just didn't work, so let's go to phase number two. So plan number two is clustering, right? So it's, uh, again, it's an unsupervised setting. Uh, what we can do is decide, okay, we're going to use an algorithm such as, I don't know, k-means or HTTP scan or your choice of uh, clustering algorithms. And you're going to do there is, uh, well, you're supposed to be red in these areas and orange there, and you know where the red, where the areas are is where you, uh, what the algorithm finds for you, right? And that has certainly perks, um, which is, for example, that you can include more features. You're not bound anymore in a very difficult way to have just um, uh, your ATV and your volume. You can bring things like I don't know the, the industry code or the volatility of the, the ATV and stuff like that. Uh, but it has downsides. And let me make a metaphor here around uh, boundaries, because. Last summer, there was this uh, childish fight around who's going to space, and there was Bezos and Branson fighting over each other, saying, that, well, I'm 80 kilometers up and I'm 100 kilometers up. Well, it doesn't matter, right? Because the atmosphere fades out, and it's just a convention where we say it stops. It just doesn't stop, right? It just fades out. And that's something clustering that cannot do well, right? Because you need to put a hard boundary there. But moreover, we said, why do we want clusters at all? That's not the problem we need to solve. We're not they didn't ask us to segment customers or shoppers. They asked us to say, what's anomalous, right? So maybe we're targeting actually the wrong problem. So we went back 
And we thought, what else can we do? Plan number three, a linear system. Huh. And uh, even for those of you here in the audience that are afraid of equations, I'm sure that you feel comfortable reading that one, right? So just a linear model with volume and ATV on it and maybe an offset. And well, it has some perks, it's very easy. Right? So it's explainable and easy. You're going to have two coefficients and you're going to have certain performance. The borders are no borders, that's bad, right? Because when, when things fade out, then it's nice because maybe you can have a hyperplane that fits that if you don't do quadratic polynomials and stuff like that. Uh, but, but definitely you will not be able to, to find the aggressive uh, cuts as clustering would do. And in the end, the detection performance is not that good. So we went to number four, plan number four, random forests. And uh, random forests are supervised learning algorithms that we use in unsupervised matter. I will come to that. But the idea with random forests is that they're nonlinear algorithms, they're tree-based algorithms, that they could effectively split that data set in nicely in regions optimized for, right, for, 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 for performance, for detection performance, such in this uh, picture from the, from the, from the style. Uh, and, 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 and those of you who are acquainted with machine learning are saying, like, hang on a second. You're saying supervised learning, unsupervised learning, but random forest is like, well, it's a flagship of supervised learning. So what's the trick here? Let's just dive for a second in the math of it, right? So normally, when you have a machine learning uh, problem, you could have a data set with features, the matrix we normally call X, right, with rows being the samples and the columns being the features, and then a vector, a column vector, why? That contains the label, right? And in this case, the label for us is, is this fraud or is this legit, right? But we don't have that. We don't, we don't have the luxury of having these labels, right? So this is the trick. Your, um, your feature matrix X um, contains vectors, which are um, uh, columns, in this case features, and you're going to split it up and you're going to take one out and you're going to call it behavior, and that's the stuff that you want to track. In our case, it could be the shopper ratio. And you're going to take the other, the rest of the features, and use it as, as context. And that could be, for example, the ATV and the volume, right? Um, and the trick here is I'm going to try to predict the behavior based on the context. So I'm going to try to predict one feature based on the others, right? And here we're making an assumption that there is an underlying structure in the data set, which normally would go or by the name of manifolds, that you can actually extract. And those points that on adhere to that manifold are the ones that you're going to say, well, these are, uh, these are anomalies, these are unusual, right? Uh, and we're claiming here that they are unusual, 100% guaranteed. We're not claiming it's fraud. But there's a high correlation to that given on the, on the business. So again, we're going to transpose some uh, features, of, uh, one as, uh, as, the, as the target variable, the other ones just we're going to lean on them to do the predictions. And importantly, we're going to use a shallow regressor. And it has to be shallow, because otherwise it's just going to overfit, and you will not be able to extract the average behavior uh, over the data set. Right, so this is the bit the uh, introduction uh, on, the, on, on why unsupervised. So if we go back to random forests, there's many, many things we like about them. There are this has an explainability embedded onto them, because you can have feature, feature importance. Uh, you can bring, certainly, a lot of features. Uh, scalable, for example, our implementation in the Big Data platform uses the native uh, PySpark ML library, which actually does a good job, especially when you do it uh, in, uh, when you have uh, sh shallow hyperparameters. And you can bring categories. You don't need to do one-hot encoding, stuff like that. Indexing works. Um, it works really well either on boundaries or when there's no linearities and stuff like that. You have good detection performance. And in our case, you can use it fully unsupervised, right? Let me give you a test of how it works actually in real life. This is a this is a real-life data set uh, of 800 million rows that I obviously downsampled for visualization purpose and ended up with, with the UK there in the plot. Um, it has 40 input features, one target variable, and we use uh, 16 executors, there's 16 um, uh, machines basically on PySpark, uh, and 36 minutes to, to train it. And then if I ask you, where do you think the significant shoppers are on this data set? You might start thinking, like, maybe in the corners, maybe the big bubbles, where should they be? Uh, well, that's what I found. That's what the algorithm found, right? And then when you review the cases one by one, you say, well, it makes sense. This is certainly odd, right? So, well, we made a lot of progress solving the problem, but do we? Uh, not yet. Uh, there's, there's many things here that still we need to work on. First of all, we didn't just validate the model, right? So normally, on a, on, a, on a machine learning, let's say, setup, you could have a holdout test uh, set, and then you could, you, could, you could see what are your metrics there, how well you generalize. In here, we just train with the whole thing together, and we try to extract the anomalies based on that. 
And what happens if the behavior is actually two-dimensional, or three, or n-dimensional, because we've just extracted one feature, right? And a random forest has one target variable. So what can we do about it? And that's, what, uh, that's when we went to plan number five. Plan number five where, um, so let me explain the multidimensional behaviors here indeed. So two columns go to the behavior, and n minus two go to the context, for example. And again, to solve this, we went to neural networks, right? And neural networks, it's a well-known architecture that, uh, and then you can, you can leverage to do this. And for what, those of you that are a bit more, let's say, advanced on the field, you're saying, like, hang on a second, are you telling me that you're using a neural network on tabular data? Yes, I'm telling you this. And before you jump to conclusion, I invite you to read that paper, where it explains that there's very few cases where actually neural networks are OK to use over tabular data, one of them being heavy regularized settings, uh, which is the same as shallow learning. Others are like, for example, when you use transformers, uh, uh, these sorts of architectures. It's a very good paper, by the way, that has been just recently uh, uh, updated. Anyway, we just didn't use a neural net. We used a very well-known architecture called autoencoder, right? And an autoencoder is uh, a specific type of neural, of neural net that what it does is imposes uh, a symmetric architecture with a middle layer that's called the bottleneck. And the idea is that the middle layer is reduced in size, so it forces the data set to be compressed and then you decompress it. And the idea is that you're going to abuse somehow the, the, the loss in your compression to detect the anomalies, right? So you extract the manifolds, that's the literature name, and then, well, you have the embeddings there, you decode the embeddings, and if the, embedding, the decoded embedding is not the same as the input, then you have a problem there. Normally, these are the, the ones that will not work. But it just didn't work as expected for us. So we went as far as ch training the, changing the equations of those autoencoders to uh, pretty much uh, enforce the idea that we want to be very good tracking the context, and we want to be pretty shallow tracking the behavior. And when you train over a loss function, for example, for AMSC on an autoencoder, then you can, do, you can do both at the same time. So we actually uh, broke that into two components. Uh, plus uh, a specific scoring equation to see what is right, wh wh when do, where do I draw the line in a, in, a, in, a, in a local anomaly, right? And again, we implemented that with uh, the Keras layer on top of TensorFlow, distributed with Apache Spark, and uh, yeah, we use Python uh, to, to, to write all that. Now, there we solved the problem. Not fully. Why? Still, we didn't validate the model, right? So we made advances in, for example, multidimensional behavior, but we didn't solve the problem. Now, we have two new problems. One of them is scalability, because I can use PySpark ML to, to, to solve for it, to, to just uh, distribute a, a random forest regressor. And I might have volatility issues, which is a nasty side effect of uh, neural nets, especially on tabular data, where you can fall on a gradient and, and then have like a very weird prediction. The volatility we mitigated in a very, I would say, brutal but efficient way, which is basically running an ensemble of networks at the same time and then doing some bagging operation as a majority vote. And the scalability we're still exploring. We're toying around with Dask, and we're toying as well with uh, barrier mode on Apache Spark. We'll see where we get there. But anyway, numerically, we still need to validate the model. We haven't done that yet. So to do that, um, which is really a not an easy problem, right? I don't know if you have ever been exposed to this problem, but if I ever want any person asks you anytime how you uh, set hyperparameters for an unsupervised model, you're going to have a hard time answering that. So what, what we did was to create a, a test chamber. We, we created, we crafted data sets that contained the, the statistical properties that we wanted to see. Uh, in, in, in the, so basically those manifolds I was telling you about, and as well as controlling very well the, the conditional probabilities of the context and behaviors, right? So we created those data sets, and then we run a bunch of algorithms to benchmark which one was working better, right? And we found some, well, some learning, some takeaways from there. One of them was that we had a bug <laughs> because we were even doing categorical treatment in the right way. So we had to change the equations, and then I, uh, yeah, honest there, it's, these are the real equations running in production. This is not a Wikipedia extract, because people ask me if that's the case, but it's not. It's a true story. Now, um, after all this, uh, I wanted to show you a bit how it works in reality with some real cases, some, some business cases that, uh, that we have seen around on, on SCORE. Uh, SCORE number one, what we call the chopstick case. Uh, why is it? So 
platform abuse. In this case, we had a seller that he was a, a, a young seller, let's say 30 days old only, right, rather new. And we had seen some weird stuff going on there. For example, hard transfer rates recently, like one significant shopper doing 90% of the volume and specifically on low ATVs and repetitive amounts, right? So what happens there is you plan to scam people, you set up a, 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 a profile in any platform to sell stuff, you basically buy yourself uh, stuff for low value, you increase your rating, you have five stars, wonderful seller, people go and buy legit shoppers, and then you scam them, right? And we call it the chopstick case because one of our uh, food delivery merchants uh, found this out on a uh, Chinese restaurant that was ordering chopsticks for zero euros, so they could have the chance to bump their rating and, uh, and, and inflate it this way, right? So this is how it comes handy. We have the KYC attributes and we have transaction signals that give it away. Another case is account takeovers. Uh, if you are familiar with platforms and e-commerce, uh, account takeover is one of these monsters. Uh, what it means is that they're going to steal your credentials and then they're going to do stuff with it, which is not good. And how did we find out? Because we saw a recent change of KYC attributes and a sudden change in the transaction profile of that seller, right? Given away, for example, spikes and, uh, on the volume itself and unusual growth and also the variety of countries that we were seeing for that specific profile. Another case that doesn't happen a lot but could happen is money laundering, right? Uh, in this case, normally smurfing is the, the way to go. So you, you have repetitive amounts and you have low authorization rate and, um, and uh, sometimes prepaid methods. So you can also give it away tracking those behaviors. Another one is a fraud ring. This is less, um, this is more based on this uh, component uh, uh, where, where we, we, we put together, uh, based on similar or, or identical KYC attributes, communities, right? Uh, and then each of those sellers had something off, like, for example, uh, refusals for fraud or just a, a low shopper variety. And once you basically had the lead on one, you have the lead on the six of them, right? So you can bump the risk score of all of them, right? This is, this is how, this is how um, score works. Now, what is... Next, after all this, did we, did we absolutely solve the problem already? So that's up and running, it's in production, so, you know, our merchants are using it. Is that it? Are we, are we doing anything else or do we want to keep digging here? Um, let's go back a second on how we formulated the problem. Um, we um, had this data set, right? And there's a texture, there is a graph here that we, we have shoppers and we have sellers. And we said one seller is fraudulent and one shopper is also uh, fraudulent. And, and that's fine, right? Uh, what we did there, though, was if you think about how we posed the problem and how we solved the problem, was we uh, looked at the sellers and we looked at their surroundings, right? So we found a representation vector for the seller looking at their surroundings, which is exactly the same as saying that we broke these out into, into three different components and we evaluated them separately, right? Having them, uh, having them uh, in, in three different components, right? That's a bit of a pity, isn't it? Because we, we had some valuable information here, right? What if this shopper and this seller were the same person? Right? And what if what what happens if 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 the people that connected to them were also in the mix? We could never know, right? Because that's just properties of the of 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 the texture of the of the network, underlying network that will give it away. Right? This is the well, this is basically graph machine learning, right? And this is where we're heading next. So what we're doing is uh, try to create those graphs. Um, learn from them, right? And extract patterns that are way more, well, tasty, juicy, or at least way more representative based on the texture. Not only looking at the isolated uh, feature vector of each seller, but also throwing in, in the edges to see how they connect to each other, right? For that, we're using PyTorch, geometric, PyG. Uh, it's a really nice, it's a really nice uh, framework, which I encourage people to, to use. Uh, and... Um, yeah, I, I knew I, I rushed to be through it, sorry, Alexandra, but uh, last message here, 
Uh, we're hiring, yeah, sorry, I had to say it. And if you don't like the Dutch cuisine, as I don't do, you don't need to worry because we're also opening up a hub in Madrid, so then you can enjoy nice tapas. And uh, yeah, um, that was my presentation, uh, short and sweet. Uh, that's my LinkedIn, feel free to connect. Uh, if you throw a message saying that you, you attended this talk, then it gives me some context, so I know you're not trying to sell me anything. And um, yeah, that's everything I wanted to tell you. Thank you. We have um, a bunch of questions. Are you getting ready? Yeah, I'm getting ready. Yeah. All right. Ready? One, two. So do you use cross-platform data? Uh, yes, we do. We are very open to our merchants about that, right? So we don't do shady stuff with it. So that, that's a bit the stance we have as a company. We try to be very ethical around data. Uh, at the end of the day, we do it with their permission. They know how we're doing, and we're doing for the better world, right? So it's not only for uh, commercial purposes or whatever, which just making their platforms better, and mm -hmm. we're also protecting the shoppers. So yeah, happy okay, so all around. It's a little bit of a win-win then. It is. All right. Uh, second question we have here is, um, and you've, we've talked about this, you've mentioned it a little bit. Um, do you deploy machine learning models? Um, so for, for score, we don't. What we do is basically, um, well, what I call Kleenex machine learning. Basically, you use them, you score them, you, you get the signals, and then you can basically remove the artifact. You don't need it. For online uh, fraud detection, we do deploy the models. And for that, we have a, a stack that is based on uh, uh, MLflow, for example, to do that. Okay, and, oh, I thought I was hearing something. Okay, so uh, this one's a little bit of a mouthful, so give me a second to, to read yeah. it all out. Um, so it's, how do you handle, um, well, I guess it's a, it's a two-prong two question. Oh, and there's somebody else? Okay, all right, keep it, cover, keep it coming. So how do you handle um, the very fast pace of uh, fraud changing patterns with your solution? Um, like if there is a new type of fraud and you don't still have enough data um, to train models? So we train the models uh, for a score. We train them every day. So every day there's new data and, and we look, uh, I remember like three months back or six months back data to, to, to extract patterns. At the end of the day, and that's something that is more around how we work with data, is you need domain knowledge. Right? So you need to, to work together with, with product people and with analysts, and these people will help you. For example, in this case, in this talk, they help us a ton to identify behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, what's, what's this account take cover? So it's these and that and these and that, and then we can work with that, right? So, so they are also the ones identifying, right, in contact with the merchants and, 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 and also us sitting in the table with merchants where they explain what are, what are the pain points so, so we can handle that. So it's an... It's just a never-ending story, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting because you're mentioning that. It reminds me a little bit of um, Hannah's talk earlier, where she was also talking about bringing in different people in the business to, um, you know, to do feedback loops and iterations to correct um, better the different projects. Exactly. Um, somebody is. Okay. Cool. So I I was reading another one's like typing very fast, but we're gonna get to you, so you have time. Um, so how do you deal with abrupt data drift, for example, a radical mass change in behavior due to a pandemic breakout? Yeah. Really had to bring that up. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Um, so the short answer is that typically these algorithms will not handle that well, especially when you have a, not everyone does the same. Uh, it will result in some painful uh, high false positive rate, right? Mm -hmm. um, the good thing about it is that if everything changes at the same time, then right, the data set also will pick it up. So the algorithms will also pick it up. But indeed, that's uh, something that uh, it will, it breaks the assumption of certain stationarity behind your data, right? Just because the world collapsed, right? Well, and, uh, and you'll have some, uh, some points, uh, some pain uh, adjusting to that. To solve for it, uh, what we did was, uh, very honestly, disconnect certain behaviors that they couldn't just bring anything, right? So we, couldn't, we just disconnect those models. Um, and uh, yeah, put some filters around certain industry types where we knew that that was absolutely normal to happen. Okay, so you, um, I mean, and then I'm sure that that's also given insight into what we, what we would do in similar situations in the future. Yeah. It's just very difficult to train a model to say, well, there's a pandemic going on, just affecting these sort of merchants and right. this and that, right? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, and then um, we have another one. Um, it's how do you face explainability with an un un ensemble of autoencoders? Yeah. So at the end of the day, you ensemble the predictions, right? So you will end up with one vector being the representation, the decoded representation of the input. Um, so the way we handle explainability there is to say, you're going to have a vector that you compare of truth that you're going to compare of a vector of, of a learned vector. And for your, for your true positives, one, only one of the dimensions will be off, right? And that will kind of explain uh, why the, the, the autoencoder decided to do that. Yeah, because one dimension will be very, very off. So it will be very, okay. let's say analysts pick up very quickly, like, okay, that's, that's what happened there. Because you force this, um, uh, this, force this high, hard regularization on the autoencoder, so it needs to compromise. It will compromise on that, and they will go for the, for the easy win, which is the anomaly. Okay, thank you. And um, we have one last question here. Do you have, we've got time for it. Are I do. You, you willing I do. for it? All right, cool. So it says, um, and I'll try to read this one a little bit slower because I realize I've been trying to throw them out very quickly. So do you have a separate model for each fraud type? Um, and the second question to that is actually, how do you extend your fraud detection system in general? Yeah. Uh, Usually. I, yeah, so every pair of behavior context is a new model indeed. And it's rather easy to set them up and uh, we deploy them through, through our platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, which we orchestrate through Airflow. Uh, so every time we deploy, you just set a new design file for a new model. That's my design, my context vector, that's my behavior vector, and it will just get scored. Yeah. So that's how it works. All right. Yeah. So quite a simple explanation, I guess, for a longer question. Well, I want to say thank you for coming here all the way from the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you.